Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for coming today. And uh, so I'll speak today on the Bhagavad Gita 17.15. Anudvega karam vakyam satyam priyahitam chayat swadhyaya abhyasinam chayva vanmayam tapa uchyate on how to discipline our speech. So I'll speak broadly on the topic of gossiping and how to avoid gossiping. Nice. So gossiping, you know, what is gossiping centers? How do we know whether we are gossiping? We say broadly two characteristics. When we hear something we like about someone we don't like. <laughs> when we hear something we like about someone we don't like. So, all of us, if we look at the people around us, there are some people whom we just instinctively like, some people just we don't like. Or some people, you know, maybe neutral, but over a period of interactions, sometimes it may become negative, it may become positive, whichever way. So, we have our mind inside us, and as soon as we see someone, the mind passes some opinions about some other person. You know, sometimes if a sports match is going on, then there's a commentary going on with that match. So like that, the mind has a running commentary going on inside us constantly. So you see this person short tempered, this person lazy, this person forgetful, this person insensitive, this person ill mannered. So we have these comments going on in our mind constantly. Am I audible there? Can you hear me? No? Okay. So, so now what happens? We have a certain opinions about others. So there are some people we like and some people we don't like. Now, people around us also, so I spoke about this, people we don't like, that's the part. The second part is about when we, uh, there are, in our conversations, we keep hearing different things about different people. In general, the topic that interests most people is people. You know, we can talk about things, we can talk about people, and we can talk about ideas. Mm -hmm. Broadly speaking, these are the three broad subjects of discussion. We can talk about things, objects, we can talk about... Now, of course, apart from that, we talk about, you do this, I'll do this, that's, that's functional conversation. But in the deeper beyond the functional conversation, it has to be the center on things, or people, or ideas. Now, things may be of interest to some people. Mm -hmm. Say, for example, I did engineering. So, I, when I studied engineering, it is, in general, men are more interested in things. Women are more interested in people. So, <laughs> so women go more into occupations where you know, there is personal relationships. Men can become nurses, but women are much better nurses. Because they can, they want to, they are more interested in people. They can connect more with people. And that's innately a gift so that they can connect with infants. You know, when connecting with infants and small children is very difficult because at one level, no, an infant has no rationality. The child, uh, at least up to a particular age, is always right. You know, if an adult starts complaining about something late at night, let's talk about it tomorrow. You say, why are you disturbing now? But if an infant starts crying at night, Mother can't say, why are you talk, crying now? Cry tomorrow morning. <laughs> I can't do like that. <laughs> so, that's an innate gift. So, broadly speaking, you know, men are interested more in things. People are more, women are more interested in people. Now, beyond that, there are ideas. Now, we get an idea, some inspiration. This could be conceptual or it could be something, okay, we can do this, do that, whatever. So, broadly speaking, among these three things, the most interesting is ideas. Even when advertisements have to be made about certain things, sorry, the most three interesting among these three is people. So if we consider that the mm, even if things have to be advertised, then it is usually done with people. The products are always shown with people. When and the kind of celebrities who endorse a product determines how attractive that product will be, how much that product will be sold. And similarly, ideas also need to be demonstrated through people. In fact, the Bhagavad Gita is philosophy 
and there are people who are interested in it but relatively speaking in the indian tradition the ramayana and the mahabharata and the bhagavatam they have had much more resonance with people because it is it is there are people over there bhagavad gita is of course people but it's after the initial point of krishna and arjuna speaking it's very concept rich so in some ways the mahabharat is a demonstration of the principles taught in the bhagavad gita how they are to be lived so what happens is normally in our conversation we do talk about people quite a bit so when we are talking with about people then sometimes we come to know certain things about other people which are pleasing to us sometimes we come to know something that is pleasing to us so normally if somebody hey, this person did like this oh how could they have spoken like that how could they have done like that that's how we respond at times now generally what happens is that if we hear something good about someone oh i didn't know that this person was so kind or this person was so extending or whatever then our appreciation of that person increases but it's a and we feel also feel happy oh this person is so good but in general if there is some person whom we don't like then if we hear something unpleasant about them if we what happens is if somebody we don't like and somebody speaks good about them we will stop it we don't want to hear their good side you think this person like this but i know how that person actually is we <laughs> <laughs> tend to think like that and we tend to as in general what happens we all of us when we relate with each other this is uh, of this, we all do some attribution attribution means that whenever we see somebody doing some action now we never see an action as an action alone we put that action in some context so when we like someone uh, then we attribute their action to a good motivation and when we don't like someone we attribute their action to a bad motivation say for example if somebody is uh, eating a lot i feel if we like them they must be very hungry if we don't like them such a glutton <laughs> <laughs> now it could be either in the either cases if somebody we don't like is sleeping a lot such a lazy person but if we like that person must be very tired <laughs> so what happens we see actions but those actions we don't just see them as actions why is this person doing like this we attribute some motivation to that and so this is called as a attribution assumption you know we assume or we there's a we attribute certain things and that is based on our assumptions that we have about other people so now this is in general what we how we refer to these other actions but further than that what happens is if we have a particular perception about others and then somebody speaks something which reinforces that perception then like that yeah i was right you know there is there are practically no other combination of three words that give as much satisfaction to the human ego as i was right <laughs> i was right so what happens because of this as soon as we hear something we like about someone we don't like so we have people whom we don't like so whenever we hear something oh he did like this he spoke like that he spoke like that that immediately we pounce on it we pounce on it and we start magnifying it now this is what happens in the ramayana the gossip sometimes can be harmless but sometimes it may not be that harmless see there are different kinds of aggression there can be physical aggression where people start beating each other uh, now in in civilized societies generally people will not become physically aggressive but there is verbal aggression verbal aggression is where you make innuendos where we gossip and where we assassinate the reputation of a person 
and that can hurt terribly and gossiping might just seem like some fun you know we're just talking about somebody but how it may snowball we don't know so in the uh, ramayan we have the princes ram lakshman hanuma ram lakshman bharat and shatrughna they are living together happily and dashrath has his three queens who are the queens does anyone know kaushalya kai kai and sumitra yes so now among these seen every relationship recently i was at i was in stanford i was giving a talk over there so after that one person came and asked me that you you are talking about these texts but these texts have so many objectionable things i went talk about indian texts i said what 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 do you find objection this is this polygamy isn't that objectionable so i said that there is a descript there in the scripture there is a descriptive section there is a prescriptive section descriptive mean this is how it was prescriptive mean this is how you should act so polygamy is described in the scriptures but broadly speaking it is never prescribed in the sense that wherever there is polygamy there are problems you see almost every incident some problems do come so in this case <laughs> what happens is that the three queens are living together but kai kai is the youngest and she is the fairest so dashrath although kaushalya is the senior most queen after kai kai comes Ka Ka he starts paying more attention to kai kai and kaushalya feels slighted by that but she bears it and they are living in a state of you could say uneasy in a state of uneasy calm there is no severe tension or stress between them but there is some uneasiness now in the world there are always people who have their vested interests and whenever somebody speaks something to us about someone you know why they are speaking it is important to understand it's almost whenever people speak something say what happens here kaushal uh, kai kai has a maid what is her name mantara yes now mantara has been like a nurse for kai kai she was there with her from childhood and she grew up with her she grew up under her care and she came with her after marriage to ayodhya now kaushalya ha sorry uh, mantara had a hunchback now because of that some people would sometimes tease her she was the butt of some jokes but kai kai treated her almost like a second mother respected her very much and see sometimes if we have some limitations quite often it is we who are more conscious of that than others after some time people okay this is how you are people get used to it but she was very conscious of that and what happened as kai kai became the favorite queen in the family then kai kai's stock rose in the royal palace and as kai kai's stock rose the stock of her favorite maid servant also rose so she became the most influential among the servants in the palace and then when she heard the news that ram is going to be coronated as the prince regent and then the king she was extremely agitated she thought that if ram becomes the king then his mother and his wife will become the most prominent women in the queen in the palace and if kai kai is no longer prominent then i will have no prominence and she became very insecure and angry because of that and she ran to kai kai to know kai kai was relaxing in her palace she says what are you doing sitting here in peace while everything is being stripped away from you so what do you mean what do you mean 
says, don't you know that Ram is going to be coronated as the prince regent? So actually Kai Kai loved Ram. Ram was a lovable person and basically there was a lot of amity because there were some conflicts. The conflicts were kept under major control. So she was so happy. She actually took out her jewel necklace and gave it to Mantra and she said that you have brought such a wonderful news to me. I am delighted. Here is your reward. And Mantara took that and hurled it on the ground. Says, you call this good news? This is catastrophe. He said, if Ram becomes the king, then he will see Bharat as a rival. And he, will, he may exile Bharat. Or he may find some pretext and have him executed also. This is all ridiculous. And even initially, Kaikai thought is preposterous. He says, What are you speaking? I have seen how the brothers interact with each other. There is Ram can never do such a thing. He says, You are the daughter of a king, you are the wife of a king. Still, do you not understand the ways of the king? Ways of do you want to get that chair here? If it is, because the mic is a little... Are you, is everybody able to hear? No, you can sit on the chair and be comfortable. Not so. I am more used to sitting now. Okay, sure. You keep the chair accessible in case they need it. Is everybody able to hear behind? Okay, fine. Thank you. my hearing aid. Okay, fine. Sorry for this. No problem, that's fine. So, at this point, Kaike just dismisses it. But, see, everybody has, we all have different attitudes toward different people. So, Kaike has personally no animosity against Ram. And when Mantra is saying Ram will do like this, she doesn't believe it. Then mantra, see, whenever people want to get something done through us, what happens is they know which buttons to press. They try to press this button, nothing happens. They try to press another button, nothing happens. They try this button and we get angry. Hey, now this is the button to press. So what happens is those who anger us, conquer us. Those who anger us, conquer us. Now, there are times when we need to be assertive. But if our anger is simply triggered by others' manipulation, then we may think we are, we are strong. See, anger gives the illusion of strength, but gives us weakness out. When we become angry, we feel I am being very strong. I am taking a strong stand. I am doing this. But actually, we are being manipulated over there. So when she presses the Ram button, nothing happens. Then she says, Actually, she, now she recognizes that she cannot speak anything against Dashrath directly. So she says, when Kaike is looks at it, this is preposterous. She says, if it was just as preposterous as you think it to be, now why is this coronation happening when Bharat and Shatrughna are not here? Why are they being sidelined? Now, what had happened actually is that somehow Dashrath Maharaj had got an inspiration to renounce. He had been thinking about it for a long time, but at one particular time, um, there, are, there are stories given in the Ramayana, there are stories given in the uh, other uh, Ramayans or other retellings of the Ramayana which come afterwards. So, this is not in Valmiki Ramayana. He says that. Dashrath Maharaj, he had been ruling for a long time, but at one particular point, when he was just ready to go to the court, as he, was, he just felt, you know, I am becoming old. He saw creases on his face, he saw white, white hair coming up, he says, I am becoming old, I should renounce the world now. And as soon as the inspiration came within him, he said, Ram is entirely competent, let me hand over. And then he connect, consulted astrologers, and astrologers said that, it is best that this be, if you want to do it, do it soon. So then all these factors came together and he decided to have this transfer. 
and somehow at that time Bharat and Shatrughna were not there. So what happens uh, if you if you if somebody wants to make someone look bad? None of us are perfect. Every one of us has faults. So people can find something and they can magnify it. So in this case, he said, why is this happening when they are away? And he saw that Kai, I have got Kaike's attention now. Till this point, Kaike was dismissive. But now she's hearing. And then, as soon as she noticed it, that he's got, she's got my attention, then she went for the kill. Do you know who is behind all this? Your rival, your co-wife, Kaushalya is behind this. All this time, the king was spending time with you and she must have been burning in envy. And now she has got the opportunity to get back at you. Now, although, as I said, there was no overt enmity, but there was always tension among the co-wives. And as soon as she had a caution lies behind this, immediately she became agitated. So what happened over here was that she found the button with which she could control. And then she spun a whole narrative, a whole narrative. So Mantra kept speaking, Kaiki kept hearing. Now, now we could, I wouldn't say that Kaikai and Kaushalya didn't Kaika disliked Kaushalya, but it is that there's always some tension because they were co-wives, so it's natural some rivalry would be there. But as soon as she heard, oh, she there's a scheme over there, there's a scheme to manipulate, to take everything away from me. She got completely carried away. And then you know when doubt comes in. Sometimes there are valid reasons to doubt also. But what happens when doubt comes in, it starts growing, it starts growing, it starts growing. And in general, whenever we are interacting with people, we need to begin with the presumption of innocence. We need to give people the benefit of doubt. But if we let doubt grow uncritically, then it grows and what happens? We become the plaintiff, we become the judge, we become the jury. And then without even hearing from the other person, we decide the case. You are tried and you are convicted. So that is what happened to Kai Kai. Just by hearing from Mantara and just dwelling on it, everything grew so much within her that by the end, what had happened was, she, when she went to Dashrath, or when she started, uh, she went into her, uh, the place where she would go for, it was like a sulking chamber for her. <laughs> she went there and when Dashrath came, Dashrath was in a jubilant mood. And he was aghast to see her in distress like that. So what, what happened? And then, when he says, yes, yes, you know, I'm very, she could see that she was very hurt or very angry or very upset. He says, whatever it is, he was in a very happy mood. He says, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And he was like unsuspecting deer entering into a tiger's den. And then when she asked for those horrendous benedictions, normally we don't think of benedictions as horrendous, but that's how it was. She said that, send Ram away to the forest for 14 years and let my son Bharat become the king. Dashrat couldn't believe this. So who is this person? What is she asking? She says, how, how, how has Ram ever offended you in any way? So he tried to defend. He says, if you want Bharat to, you know, he was initially not ready to give anything, but he had given the word of honor. Finally he said, no, please withdraw your request. If you want Bharat to become the king, fine, but don't send Ram away. What fault has he done? I can't live without him. But unfortunately what happened to her was, that the more Dashrath protested, the more Dashrath defended Ram, the more it reinforced her idea that this is a whole scheme. And she thought that actually I am protecting Bharat. I am protecting his rights. He is not here to protect himself, so I will protect him. So Mantara had coached, coached in the evil sense, not in the good sense, he had coached that as long as Ram is in the kingdom, Bharat 
will Bharat's hold on the kingdom will not be steady. Bharat may not even accept the kingdom, or even if he accepts, the courtiers and the citizens will not accept. Send him away for 14 years, and 14 years is a long enough time by which she Ra, Bharat will be able to show his expertise in ruling and he will win over the citizens and the courtiers. And then when Ram comes back, there will be no problem. So she says, don't compromise on either of these requests. And that's how Ram had to be exiled for no fault of his. And exile is not a it is not a mild thing. I, I just came from America about I was there for two months. So I, I presume in Canada it's not that much of an anxiety, but in America there's a lot of anxiety about people not getting their H1 visa extended. Most people are working in that category and if they don't get extended, they have to leave. So as I spoke on the Rama and it says, so the nearest we can have an example of what Ram went through when he had to leave the kingdom is if your visa is not extended. <laughs> you have to leave the country. Now you say, I have my life, I have my career, I have my home, I have my family, I have my social circle, I will leave everything and go. Now, even for that, it's not so bad for us. Because if we go to our home country, we also have a social circle there. We also have our relatives there. And even if we have to leave the country, we can take our wealth with us and go. But when Ram he went, he had to leave everything and go. See, exile is just uh, is a, the worst is reserved for the worst of criminals. And it's just one level before execution. Exec ex execution means your life itself is taken away. Exile means everything except your life is taken away. So now, uh, Dashrath felt so guilty because of this. He felt so torn, so afflicted. And eventually he lost his life. And it is through it all, Kaiki had become so stone-hearted that she did not feel anything. It's only when Bharat came back. And actually, when Bharat came back, she told him very proudly. You know, there was this whole con Nobody is actually guilty in their own eyes. It's very, very difficult for us to admit our own faults. Some people say, you know, that mm, my opinion may be wrong, but I am right. <laughs> it's very difficult for us to admit that we are wrong. And what happens, we repaint the story in such a way, sometimes consciously, sometimes even unconsciously, so that we think that we are doing the right thing. So Kaika honestly thought that actually she was, she genuinely thought that she was actually only doing all this for Bharat. And when Bharat came, Bharat asked her, where is my father? Why is the kingdom in such gloom? He said that your father has departed for the next world. The kingdom now awaits you. So what happened? And then she told, there is a conspiracy afoot to steal the kingdom away from you. And I foiled that conspiracy. She told the whole story and as Bharat heard this, he was horrified, aghast. He says, what? He says, you sent Ram away because of you my father died. And you think I'll be pleased by this? He said, oh, you are not my mother. Says, you are the goddess of destruction. De descended in our dynasty to destroy our whole dynasty. He says, I reject you as my mother. It was at that time when the real Bharat spoke these words. Now there was an imaginary Bharat in her mind, she, who, for whom she was doing all this and she was imagining that that Bharat will be pleased with me. But what happened? When this collision occurred between the imaginary Bharat and the real Bharat, then her illusion was completely dispelled. But by that time it was too late. It was too late. So, gossip you know, when it is, when it can seem like, it can seem like harmless fun. But you know, things that, things that harm less are not harmless. They may harm, they may seem to be not, they, 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 it's a little harm. 
but that little may not stay little. How it can snowball, we don't know. Nowadays, especially with social media available, you know, one person makes one innuendo or pass, passes one rumor and then just snowballs out of control. It can go all over the world. It said that you know, a falsehood can travel half the way across the planet before truth can even get dressed to go out. <laughs> <laughs> That's how things work in today's world. Now, now we might get some pleasure when we hear something negative about someone. And we might get some pleasure in sharing and telling that to others also. So quite often what happens is often people say, can you keep a secret? Now when they are saying this itself, what does it mean? That they can't keep a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Those who can't keep a secret, tell others to keep a secret. <laughs> so, usually when we hear something bad about someone, at that time it might give us some pleasure. But, what happens, especially if it is something bad about someone we don't like, then we need to check ourselves. Because at that time we will grab onto it. Our tendency will be to grab onto it. Because we already have a negative conception about that person. And then on top of that, when we hear something negative, we just grab onto like a dog may grab onto a bone, like that will grab onto it. So at that time, we have to be especially cautious. So those whom we, uh, those whom we respect and we uh, appreciate, then we will give the benefit of doubt. Sometimes we will give them only benefit of doubt and no doubt at all. That may also happen. That may not always be good. But the point is that if we already have negative conceptions about someone, and then we hear something negative. We'll just put two and two together and make 222. <laughs> we'll just expand it so much. And especially, as I said, in today's world, because we have internet and social media, things can go very fast. So what can, uh, as, as devotees who are trying to grow spiritually in a spiritual movement, we also have a particular code of behavior, a code of conduct that we expect from each other. And sometimes what happens, our spirituality, instead of making us more understanding, makes us more judgmental. Making us more understanding means, yes, I have my struggles, they have their struggles. We are all trying to move forward. But making more judgmental means, this is how you are meant to behave, why are you behaving like this? So we become more judgmental. And when that happens, then that, when there is a overall a judgmental attitude, then that is where gossip flourishes. When there is more of an understanding attitude, then gossip doesn't flourish. Gossip may come, it's like the soil is barren. Then whatever weeds are there, they don't grow. So if you consider gossip to be like a weed, then a judgmental attitude, a suspicious attitude, that is the soil where the weed of gossip grows very fast. So I'll talk about this, I'll, about how to deal with gossip in three broad parts. The first is that you know, at a fundamental level, we have to see that our spirituality needs to make us more understanding, more empathic, not more judgmental. Atma upam yena sarvatra samam pashyati yo arjuna sukham vayadiva dukham Sayogi Paramo Mataha. In 6.32 in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about the perfection of yoga. At one level, perfection of yoga, Krishna says, is to see him everywhere. That's 6.30. Yomam Pashyati Sarvatra Sarvam Chamai Pashyati Tasyaham Na Pranashami Sachamena Pranashyati. One who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me. That person is never lost. Uh, and I am never, that was never lost to me and I am never lost to them, Krishna says. But then two verses later, he talks about that perfection of spiritual consciousness is not just seeing God everywhere. In two verses later, he also says, seeing everyone equally. Seeing everyone equally means that ultimately we see everybody is a soul like me. Everybody has a body and mind and everybody is struggling. Now what I am struggling with may be different from what somebody else is struggling with. 
Now, I may be struggling with anger and somebody else might be struggling with lust. I might be struggling with depression and somebody else might be struggling with loneliness. I might be struggling with uh, lethargy and somebody else might be struggling with hyperactivity. Now, we all have different kinds of weaknesses. But if we see the spiritual knowledge, spiritual knowledge essentially means as applied to relationships is to be able to see people separate from their weaknesses. Okay, this person is here, may I have this weakness. But if we if we apply permanent labels on people, then where is our spiritual vision? We are just being so judgmental, we are reducing people to their weakness. Or this person, the all the I said earlier earlier labels we have that we may lazy or arrogant or this or that. In spiritual life we can also add a label deviant. This person is deviating, this person is not following, this person. So what happens? At one level, this is the person over here, this is the person over here, this is their weakness. And then on top of that is our label. So when we affix a label on someone, then what happens? We stop seeing them as they are. Yes, they have their weaknesses, but beyond that they are soul. So our spirituality means we should see more strongly beyond the weakness to the person. That's how we will become more understanding. But sometimes in the name of spirituality, we, we see just the label. We don't see the soul, we don't see the weakness, we just see the label. And then we reduce the person to that label. So for example, I got this to demonstrate this. Say, if this is a sheet. Now if this is here, I can't see him right now. But the closer this comes to me, then I can't see anything except this sheet. So similarly, in our opinions about people, they're like that. We cannot have avoid having opinions about people. And we have to function in the world and our mind gives opinions. But we need to hold our opinion loosely, not tightly. The tight, more tightly we hold the opinion, then we can't see anything except the opinion. But loosely means, yes, this is, this is what I think about this person. But who do I really know everything about that person? I don't know everything even about myself. In every day, if we observe ourselves, we discover so many things about ourselves. No, I got so angry over that. I didn't know I was such a short-tempered person. I felt like that, okay. We discover good and bad about ourselves also. So what to speak of our others? So our, that's, that's the first point I said for dealing with, envy, dealing with gossiping tendency is that we, we will have opinions, but we hold them loosely, lightly, at a distance, not tightly completely covering our vision. Rather, our spirituality, what it should do is, we should be able to see people as souls who are potentially divine, as parts of God. And beyond that, they have certain certain body-mind covering based on which they have some conditionings. So I need to, uh, now we cannot be blind to people's weaknesses. If, if we know somebody is forgetful and that person, uh, we have something very, some very important thing to be done. Now, if we forget that they are forgetful, then we will be a fool. We cannot, we cannot afford to forget that. Maybe it's our duty to remind them or tell that somebody else to remind them or tell somebody else to do that. So that's a, that's a functional understanding. So we can't avoid opinions. We, we need for functioning, we need some understanding of how people are. But we can't apply those labels permanently on them and reduce people to their labels. So our, if our spirituality is making us more judgmental, means making our judgmental means obsessed on the labels then we we will have walls between us and them and that is where gossip will flourish but if you are more understanding that means there is the label there is the there is the deficiency there's the behavior and beyond that there is a person so spirituality means we see the person beyond the particular behavior and that way we can avoid being uh, being easy Pray, sitting ducks to gossip. If you are empathic, yes, this person maybe have may, even if they have done like that, even if the gossip is true. Now, more often than not, gossip is not true. But even if it is true, we can be more empathic. And they have their struggles. I have my struggle. At the first point, the second point would be that in order to deal with gossip, 
we learn to give others as much benefit of doubt as we would like them to give us all of us there are somebody can speak bad things about us also and if somebody started spreading rumors things about us and then never asked us we would feel so bad about it so we are uh, pajanakya pandit says that atmavat sarvabhute issue same point you see everyone equally like yourself this atmavat sarvabhute issue is basically a, a vedic or dharmic version of the golden rule in christianity do unto others as you would want others to do unto you so that means that if i were in the situation how would i prefer the other person to be so let me try to give them as much benefit of doubt now this is not easy to do but it is very very helpful uh, i travel across the world and sometimes i have to uh, mediate and try to resolve conflicts but sometimes you know people are so judgmental you know, i was at one conflict resolution uh, session a mediation session and two people were uh, trying to talk with each other talking with each other so one person was trying to resolve the issue he says i know you are angry with me the other person said i am not angry with you anger is an expensive emotion you are not worth it <laughs> 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 now let me somebody has already judged and convicted that person and reduce them to nothing so then now you it might seem like very clever to say something like this you know but imagine if somebody said like that to us how would we feel about it so give others the benefit of uh, give others the same benefit of doubt that we would like others to give us and it is helpful especially when we are about to judge someone when we hear something from someone and then we are about to speak it to someone else or even when somebody is about to speak it at that time he said tell me more about it see quite often when we are hearing about krishna we start thinking okay when will this class end but when somebody starts gossiping more more <laughs> please speak more it becomes like that so but whenever it starts at that time it's helpful to uh, to look at times when we have ourselves been judged and just living a life for 20 30 40 50 60 60 years whatever we have lived we we will we all are have been at the have been the you could say victims of misjudgment we have been the victims of gossip we have been targets of that so how we feel about it so generally any uh, negative resolution is very difficult to stick to if i say i will never get angry that is a very difficult resolution to keep because what happens in that resolution it is more focusing on what i will not do and that is that creates a sense of deprivation that requires a sense of control which we often may not have so a more positive resolution in that case is that i will respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely that means that if i was angry if I, somebody were angry at me i would expect them to speak politely okay i may have made a mistake if nobody likes to be spoken rudely or arrogantly or dismissively disrespectfully so so i'll respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely so similarly if we say that you know i will when whenever we hear somebody gossiping about someone speaking something which hey, we feel joy when we hear something bad about someone and i will respect everyone's right to get a fair hearing i will respect everyone's right to get a fair fair hearing now it could be that there is a person has done something wrong but everybody deserves a fair hearing you know it's it's very painful for us when people judge us without hearing from us also so it will be something similar for others so if we can learn to give others that benefit of doubt as much benefit of doubt as we would want them to give to us now we may say but that person didn't give me benefit of doubt why should i give them now that's true it's 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 understandable that kind of emotion this person judge me why should i not judge them this person gossiped about me why should i not gossip about them this is where i come to the last point that actually 
<clears throat> in the spiritual path there are different kinds of tests or temptations now some temptations are very easy to perceive you know if if say we are we are gone to supermarket and we see something which you know, nobody is noticing there are no cameras maybe i can just shoplift it we get the tendency we get the thought over there now if we have a reasonably developed sense of conscience we understand hey, this i should not do it i'm feeling tempted but i should not do it now at one level saying no to a temptation is painful but some some things which we easily identify as temptation then we can say no to it much more easily but what happens it's much more dangerous when our when our intelligence is guarding us but sometimes what happens the intelligence starts instead of guarding pointing out this is temptation intelligence start justifying so i'll conclude with this point that see basically um, if inside us there is a lower side and there is a higher side so broadly you could say the mind is associated with the lower side the impulses so the mind has a tendency to gossip and the intelligence has a tendency to intelligence tendency is to see long term to see or uh, to see uh, things in a broader perspective and whatever the mind says the intelligence evaluates the intelligence checks che checks means in two senses the word check can have check means evaluate check also means regulate so the mind says come on yell at this person but the intelligence checks then what happens then if the intelligence is checking then we want just uh, wildly given to our urges so if unfortunately our mind gets con con mind controls the intelligence then what happens we do wrong and then we justify that wrong and i was talking where i was at one place and there the many devotees had complaints about one of the leaders over there that he was very short tempered and and when i was talking with him he says i don't need to learn anger management people just need to learn to not make me angry <laughs> <laughs> so basically if we outsource the responsibility for our behavior to someone else then what is happening our intelligence is being used to justify what we are doing rather than to regulate what we are doing and that is a very very dangerous situation to be in so at that time when we see somebody start speaking some gossip and then our mind can be so cunning that sometimes we start sharing with the others and we say actually i am increasing awareness in the community <laughs> now if you want to increase we are here as the international society for krishna consciousness so if you want to raise awareness raise awareness of krishna speak about krishna now if you want to speak aware aware is awareness about people and their wrong doings well actually speaking you no know, to the scriptures themselves tell that kaliyuga is an ocean of faults and now to raise awareness about people's faults requires in kaliyuga to raise awareness about people's faults requires as much expertise as is required to show people water in an ocean <laughs> water is everywhere if you are in an ocean and if you are lost we need to raise awareness of the land that is where you go land is there so point now sometimes what happens when we tell people's faults we feel i am so clever i can see faults in this person i can tell the faults of other person but what is the use of that now of course there are certain situations where if somebody is abusing their power and then they have to be that has to be pointed out then in a proper uh, sensitive vaishnav way that can be done but most of the time gossiping means uh, if our intelligence starts saying that you know actually i am raising awareness then actually we need to raise aware our own awareness that my mind has taken over my intelligence so we need to keep our intelligence strong and one way to keep the intelligence strong is by studying shastra 
by connecting with Krishna. That means when we connect with Krishna, like I said, this person, this person judged me, so why should I not judge that person? But if we do like that, then where is our spirituality? Where is our Krishna consciousness? So a devotee's attitude is that, okay, in this situation, this person is speaking like this. How can I best serve Krishna? In this situation, how can I serve Krishna? And sometimes it might just be by changing the subject. And that person is talking something gossip, we change the subject. And we talk, start, start talking something about, more about Krishna. If that person keeps talking about that, then we can politely, you know, either walk away from there or politely say, I'm uncomfortable talking about this. Can we talk about something else? If somebody insists, no, 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 this is what we need to talk about. Then we might, if we can't walk away, we can just be there for whatever time is required and then be a little careful about associating with those people. We can't change people entirely. Some people just love to gossip. You know, they don't get rasa in chanting the holy names. They get rasa in gossiping about those who are chanting the holy names. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens with such people, it's very important that we protect our bhakti. So Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that Ye thamam prapadyante tam As all people surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. What this means is Krishna's movement is so big that Krishna, just as Krishna is a kalpataru, Krishna is a desire fulfilling tree. So Krishna's movement is also like a desire fulfilling tree. So a desire fulfilling tree means Whatever we desire, the tree will give us that. So in Krishna's movement, whatever we desire, we'll get it. If somebody wants power, somebody wants respect. In Krishna's movement, we can get a lot of respect. Isn't it? Where else if you go, as soon as you enter, if you just become a little senior, people will bow down to you. That's what happened in many places. So if you want respect, we can get respect. If we can get, if you want power, we can get power. If we want money, we can get that also. If somebody wants controversy, they can get a lot of controversy also. If somebody wants gossip, they can get gossip also. And if somebody wants Krishna, they can get Krishna also. It's up to us, what do I want? So some people unfortunately might have got sidetracked when they are here, but they are interested in they are interested in gossiping. They have not really got a taste for Krishna, nor are they interested in getting a taste for Krishna. So then we have to say, what have I come here for? I have come here for Krishna. So let me associate with those whose association inspires me to move toward Krishna. And let me try to become a person who will encourage others to go towards Krishna. So that's where the Krishna vision, that we are here for connecting with Krishna. So how can I serve Krishna in this situation? How can I please Krishna in this situation? When we have that attitude, then what will happen? At, at the very least, we won't become transmitters of gossip. And at the best, we might even be able to transform gossip. That means you don't gossip. Sometimes it just requires one person. Now, there's one person who is inflaming and spreading rumors. See, in general, most people go with the crowd. So there's one person who is active. I was at an interfaith conference recently and there they are talking about almost all religious traditions, the extremists are very few. See most people who come to any religious path, they have come primarily to, to get some aid for moving ahead in their life and to grow spiritually. But there are always some extremists and usually those who are at the extreme, they are the most noisy. Mm -hmm. hey, this is right, that is wrong, this is like this, this is like that. And when what happens? If we go along with them, so if there's one person who is like that and nobody opposes them, then everybody goes that way. Because most people tend to be go along with the flow. But if you just stem the flow, let's not talk about this. Or, you know, we need to find out more, whatever. Stem that flow, then we can actually not only protect ourselves, but we can also protect the community around us. And that's how Anudvega Karamba can speak in a way that doesn't agitate people's minds, but speak in a way that helps others to come towards Krishna. You know, we speak not to, often we speak to give others a piece of our mind. You know, we get angry, we have some suspicions, we have some, make some accusations. We should speak not to give others a piece of our mind, we should speak to give others peace of mind. 
<laughs> but unfortunately we take away our peace of mind and take away others peace of mind so if we try to see how i can please krishna how i can go closer to krishna then that is a very powerful way by which we can avoid the tendency to gossip so i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke on this topic of avoiding how to avoid gossiping so what what does gossip mean i think two things does anyone remember yeah to hear something about someone you don't like. To hear something? But someone you don't like. No, something more. Let's hear something. something like yes. <laughs> to hear something we like about? Something we don't like. Someone we don't like. Yeah, <laughs> do not like. But thank you. Thank you. That's gossip. So then I talked about how we have our opinions about others. Some people you just like, some people you don't like. And in the, so this may just be instinctive gut feelings or this may be based on experience and interactions. But either way, we have opinions, our mind keeps giving commentary about others, whoever we associate with. And then I talk about, when we talk broadly, we might talk about three things. Does anyone remember? Things, things people, people, ideas. So most people are interested in people in general. So now when we talk about people, how do we talk about them? So then I talk about the story of Mantara, how she manipulated Kaikai. Kai. So that her vested interest of maintaining her royal position as the most prominent uh, maid servant could be maintained. So when people speak some gossip about someone, you, something negative about someone, something is going on and they have their vested interests. And they will find out which button can be pressed so that we can become controlled. Those who anger us, conquer us. And then I talked about how uh, so, so gossip is not just some harmless fun. Things that harm less are not harmless. Eventually they can snowball. And in today's world with social media around, you know, character assassination can go across the world even before somebody can issue a clarification. So that's why uh, we need to be careful. And they talk about three steps by which we can avoid uh, the gossiping tendency. First is that we become more empathic, not more judgmental by our spirituality. That means people are souls, parts of God. They have certain body mind, which means based on that they have certain limitations. And beyond, based on their limitations and our experience of their limitations, we form some labels. So to be judgmental means to reduce people to their labels, to hold the label so close to our eyes that we don't see anything apart from that label. Whereas to be spiritual means to go beyond the label, to go beyond the body and mind, to go to the soul. And see, everyone is a soul like me. Everyone everyone is potentially spiritual and that brought us to the next point if everybody is so like me then to deal with gossip let me give others the same benefit of doubt that I would like them to give me so I talked there about how the presumption of innocence is very important otherwise we can we can jump to conclusions I talked about attribution we attribute certain behavior, certain motivations to people's behavior based on our presumptions about them. And <clears throat> generally to make a negative resolution is very difficult. I won't get angry or I won't gossip. But a more positive resolution is easier to keep that. I'll respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely or I'll respect everyone's right to have a fair hearing. So that way we can, we can give people the benefit of doubt. And if we feel that but they didn't give me the benefit of doubt. They judge me. Why should I not judge them? Then we have to think that, why am I here for? You know, our mind can become so strong that it can use the intelligence to justify what it is doing. But the intelligence is meant to regulate, to check the mind. Check means to evaluate and regulate. And for doing that, we need to hear scripture regularly and strengthen our spiritual connection with Krishna. Then we can think, why, why am I here for? Krishna's movement is like a kalpat, like a desire fulfilling tree. So if we want respect, if we want power, if we want gossip, and if we want Krishna, whatever we want, we can get over here. So we have come here to get Krishna. So let us act in a way that can help us to move closer to Krishna. And let us associate with those who can help us to move closer to Krishna. And at the very least by this, we can avoid becoming transmitters of gossip. And at best, we can even become transformers of the gossipy environment. So if we are, ju we are not judgmental, if we give the benefit of doubt and we are Krishna conscious, then the soil of our relationships 
will become barren as far as the weed of gossip can grow and it can become fertile so that the the seed of krishna bhakti can grow and that can enrich ours and others lives forever thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna so any questions or comments yes sir do you have any comments from any comments mata ji you have any comments Yes. Um, just a question. I guess uh, fault finding would fall along the same lines as that, or quite similar. And how how can you get over that automatic fault finding tendency, or uh, to okay, yeah. find those faults in others? Is that is that possible? Yeah. Is it possible to get over the fault finding tendency? Well, firstly, every tendency has a black and a white side. So. sometimes some standards have to be maintained and for that if somebody is not doing the right thing noting the fault is not a problem this is how it should be done but this is how it is being done that's okay but when we talk about fault finding tendency that means we tend to see the fault first and we tend to see the fault the most as i said we reduce the person down to the fault so we if at all somebody has a very strong fault finding tendency we could use that fault finding tendency to find faults with the fault finding tendency itself <laughs> everything can be used in devotional service <laughs> so we can use it use the fault finding tendency to find faults with the fault finding tendency what does that mean that means the one thing is that see everybody has faults i was once doing a program a workshop with the devotees and then i was talking about tolerance so i said when you practice in spiritual life you have to tolerate many things so what all the things you have to tolerate so one devotee raised his hand said yes he said we have to tolerate devotees mm-hmm. <laughs> we have to tolerate devotees i said yes that's a good realization that if you are trying to practice spiritual life we have to tolerate each other because all of us have defects but as we grow spiritually we will realize that devotees are tolerating us it's not that we are tolerating others others also tolerating us it's how, that's how it is so in general uh, if we consider the fact that all of us have faults and uh, the different people may have different faults so how do, how would we feel if somebody keeps finding faults within us now we are all here as volunteers and if somebody finds faults too much we just become discouraged and we go away so the most important thing that is required for anyone to perceive perse- persevere on the spiritual path is encouragement is encouragement appreciation kind words and if we if we find faults basically we dishearten people and people just now people just we just go away and then what is the use of that so sometimes it might be that a person is already burdened by 10 15 things that have gone wrong in their lives and one small fault that we find in them that might like become like a unbearable burden for them so fault finding doesn't really help in the sense that fault finding simply alienates and disheartens people now if at all we have to find faults in the sense that we have to follow certain standards and somebody is not following them then we have to do it in a very sensitive way so one of the best best uh, mm, not judges the best parameters for understanding whether we have the adhikar whether we have the right to find fault is to check our own reaction to it if we get joy in finding fault <laughs> then that means we are not purely motivated that means even if we do even if we speak politely something in our tone will come out and that will alienate the other person so the the person who can find fault is the person who gets no joy in finding fault that per- the purpose is simply to help the other person now if if you go on this path then it's going to hurt you it's going to hurt others also so if that is if we don't get any joy in finding faults then we it's likely that at least at a subconscious level no some you no know, sometimes you know when people some people are finding faults you can almost see a glee on their face yeah hey, i caught you <laughs> and it's it's very alienating when it is like that 
So that's the second thing. When at all we have to find fault, we should get no pleasure in it. And thirdly, we have to find the sometimes our tendencies as soon as we notice a fault, just speak it at that point. But sometimes that may not be the right time to speak it. In general, uh, first of all, what has if, is it, the soul is here, the, pers the particular deficient behavior is here. So we need to, we may have to evaluate the behavior, but we need to validate the person first. That means this is not a rejection of you. This is not a judgment about you. This is about this. So only in a relationship where there is some trust, there is some uh, understanding that the other person is my well-wisher. When the other person feels validated by our overall conduct in that relationship, then even if they feel evaluated at some other aspect, they won't they won't get carried. They won't uh, they won't feel too bad about it. So in general, we if our interactions with others have to be there, we need to the appreciation needs to be more than the than the criticism than the fault finding. Sometimes what happens is that we have a lot of appreciation in our heart, but we don't speak that at all. And the only thing we speak is false. And the only interaction with we have is someone, hey, you didn't do this. Why did you do like this? Why did you forget this? Why did you do that? Then, and it's, it's, the relationship becomes very strained by that. So we need to appreciate genuinely. And then um, the way that appreciation and the person feels validated, then if we have to find some fault, that's, that's okay at that time. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. How do we lose the associative aspects of the mind? You, you kind of mentioned how when we interact with other people, we have to put on labels and hmm. things, but like, I kind of notice when I'm doing meditation or yoga, it's like there's no association, so there's a different spot, and I have to come out and then start playing a role. You know what I mean? Play the role. Hmm. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. So how do we as, um, prevent the associative mode of the mind where we have to have some functional opinion about the people but that shouldn't carry over in other aspects. Yeah, I think is I did an exercise, I was in Australia recently and we did a retreat over there. So we did one exercise among that was it. L let the first thought that you have about anyone be positive. This is actually a Vedic saying. It was one way of it. Let, let, let everyone be happy. That's one Sarva Sukhina Bantu. Sarve Jana Sukhina Bhavantu. But there's another is that let my thought, first thought about everyone be positive. And then, so the exercise that we had done was that the people about whom we tend to think, neg think negative. Now write down at least three positive attributes about them. We will have to sometimes struggle to find those attributes. But if you do it, we find that and then keep that with us. And especially before we are going to interact with that person, sometimes we know some interactions are like walking into a minefield. Because already there is a history of tension. And before that, just try to look at those positive attributes. So at that time when the impulses are going very strong, the mind, as you said, in associative mode, at that time for our intelligence to work, and to think about something else, it's be difficult. But if our intelligence has already done the work, and then we keep the product of that work ready with us, then we can simply refer to the product of the work. That's easier. In general, we cannot be as perceptive in the mode of passion as we are in the mode of goodness. The mode of passion where we are running around doing things. Mode of passion is mode of goodness is when we are thoughtful. So, so when we are calm and thoughtful, mm -hmm. we write down the good qualities of others and, and the, when we are running around and we are about to have some crucial conversations, high voltage conversations, high stake conversations, then before that look at that. So at least that positive attitude will, will that, that those, thinking of those positive at, attributes of that person will bring some positivity into that interaction. And it's also good if we can talk with somebody who appreciates that person? In my interaction, this person has been so judgmental. This person has been so like this. But is there someone else? Who, you see? Sometimes we see that somebody likes so much. What do you see in that person? No, but, but 
maybe they are seeing something which we are not seeing. So it's very difficult for us to change our opinion ourselves. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to have this opinion about this. I don't want to be negative. But if our interactions have been negative, of or our impressions from those interactions have been negative, it's very difficult to change it ourselves. But talking with somebody who has had more positive interaction, that person helps quite a bit. Thank you. Is a question here? Yes, please. What if a person's in an unfortunate situation where let's say um, they're subjugated to a person that's very angry, very gossipy? So let's give an example of someone who has to go to work every day and they have a neighboring coworker who's very angry, gossipy, negative. So they can control their emotions, they'll try not to they'll try to meditate, they'll try to be positive, they'll try to be positive with him or her. But in this situation, this person is aligned with he's angry, he's ignorant, he's gossipy. Mm. So he has to, unfortunately, um, be subjugated to this on a daily basis. Yeah, it's difficult. Because that's, that's his first work, or that's his family member. Yeah. This way, or a neighbor, which you can't just get rid of. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> So what do we do if we have a person who is very angry, gossipy, negative and we have to be with them in work or home or neighborhood? We can control our behavior. Yeah, we can just control ourselves but what about them? There are broadly two kinds of people. Some people bring happiness wherever they go and some people bring happiness whenever they go. <laughs> and in everybody's life, there will be some people in two categories, both the categories. So it's just the way the world is fashioned that some people will be some people will be people who will we will heave a sigh of relief when we don't have to interact with them. That's how it is. Now generally we can't change anyone. What we can basically do is that every relationship works best at particular distances. Mm -hmm. That means that in every relationship there is a bond and there is a boundary. And if there is no bond then there is no relationship but if there is no boundary then also there is no proper relationship. Boundary, so we, we can't control the other person. But to some extent, we can define the boundaries of the relationship. That means that if that person talks and we don't pay much attention to them, if if we have the if we have the kind of relationship, we can tell them, I don't like to talk about these things. I would prefer not to talk about it, whatever is it. Now we set the parameters. Now if they may go on doing it, but we don't have to reciprocate. Especially in today's world where it's more egalitarian. Generally, the mood is that if you don't step on my shoes, step on my feet, I won't step on your feet. So, so if we set the boundaries, then that person may be the way they are, but it won't affect us that much. This person continues to push your button. Yeah, okay, I'll come to that point. <laughs> no, so now this is an important point that if they keep, press, if they keep uh, pressing our buttons, so the issue is here that uh, we all Mm, just as sometimes we sustain physical wounds, mm, we also sustain emotional wounds. So sometimes say somebody has got a bad shoulder. Now sometimes the bad shoulder is so bad that you have to go to a doctor and do some therapy and try to get it healed. Sometimes it's just that, okay, your movement is limited, but you go on with life with that. So just as different physical wounds we deal with differently, some we just let them heal naturally, some we take some intensive therapy to heal it. Some we just learn to live with it, it's not curable. So what happens? The pain because of the physical wound would be there. But over a period of time, and I said, this is how it is. Because some people stammer while speaking. Sometimes some stammer the therapy might help them to cure it. Some people just have to listen, no, I, nothing is working. So I'll communicate with whatever way I can using this, with this limitation itself. So like that, we also will in the course of relationships sustain some emotional wounds. So now some emotional wounds, we may want to immediately heal them. No, this, is, this shouldn't happen like this. But some emotional wounds might just be like some incurable physical wounds. They might just be there. So then what we need to do is, 
we may have to live with pain but we don't have to live in pain what does that mean we expand our consciousness that live with pain means pain is a companion but live in pain means pain becomes the container that means we that is what consumes our consciousness we can't think of anything so live with pain means we expand our consciousness to see okay this person is like this and this person keeps speaking like this let me try not to take this person's word seriously so it's not that easy but if we expect that if we accept that this person is going to speak like this so then gradually we we'll, we if we decide to you know, we all can develop a thick skin we all as we grow spiritually we want a tender heart but we need to cover that tender heart with a thick skin so there are some people who will just criticize and in some ways we just have to move on in our life without taking their words so seriously that means as i said that the dogs may bark but the caravan rolls on so it's important to if you're going to interact with such people or work with such people it's important to have the bigger picture in my mind is what am i here for what is my purpose mm-hmm. say if i just going for a, jo- a stroll and somebody insults us how dare you insult me you know we might turn and uh, argue with that person or confront that person but say if you are going for a important job interview and while going on somebody insults the insult is the same and it will affect but i don't have time for this let me move on so in general if our purpose becomes prominent in our consciousness we focus on that purpose then what happens then that pain might still be there but the pain won't consume our consciousness because our consciousness has become bigger by which we are focusing on the purpose and okay this person i have to tolerate let me just live with it and let me move on so tolerance comes primarily by tolerance essentially means to keep small things small so that we can focus on the big things so now unless we have some big thing to focus on what will happen the small thing will become big if if we don't have anything to fight for it's not that we'll stop fighting if we don't have anything to fight for we will fight for anything <laughs> if we don't have anything to fight for we will fight for anything so in general uh, if we don't have a purpose some something that is important for us something that we want to contribute in our life something which we really want our life to represent then any small thing will become big and of course big things will become huge out of proportion only but if we focus on that big purpose then we may have to live with pain but we won't live in pain okay thank you any of the ladies have any questions how to overcome the dualities of life the how to overcome the dualities of life as we said just now okay yes how to overcome the dualities of life na praharshet priyam prapya no dvijet prapya cha priyam sthir buddhi rasam mudho brahma vid brahmani sita in 5.20 in the bhagavad gita krishna says that had don't become elated when there is happiness and don't become dejected when there is distress so it's interesting what he's saying is he is not saying don't feel happiness and don't feel distress distress and happiness will come and we will experience it and sometimes good things will happen something bad things and bad things will happen and these dualities will be there what krishna is saying don't you can't blind ourselves to the dualities but don't become elated when the distra- when the pleasure comes don't become dejected when the pain comes now how do we do that so first point is we don't deny the duality but this is brahma with brahmani sthita by focusing on spiritual reality by focus on brahman ultimately the supreme brahman is krishna so if we study spiritual knowledge and then we practice bhakti yoga then we start connecting with krishna and if we connect with krishna then we start understanding that absorb connection with krishna absorption in krishna is like a you could say a 5 million dollar gain and that is say if we are going on a road say we have to get to a, our our ancestor or some some relative was passed they given the inheritance 
but we have to reach within a particular time if we reach there then we'll get the inheritance otherwise it will go to the state hmm? so we are we now are going there and there we'll get 5 million dollars but now at that time while we are going along the road if we see a 5 dollar bill on the road say it's 5 dollar let me get it you go and grab it but as soon as you go to grab it it flies away and then we are meant to go this way but the bill is flying this way and we keep flying we keep chasing after the 5 dollar bill 5 dollar bill and what happens we miss the 5 million dollars or on the other hand see if you are going along that five that road and we have a 5 dollar bill in our pocket and some thief comes and grabs that 5 dollar he says how dare you take this 5 dollar we start fighting with them and they start pulling and we start pushing and we start pushing and we start pulling and we start fighting 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 and we get caught in that and again we miss the 5 million dollars so for us life's pleasures are like a 5 dollar game the world's pleasures worldly pleasures and worldly pains are like that 5 dollar loss whereas our connection with krishna our devotion to krishna our absorption in krishna is a 5 million dollar game yam labdhwa cha param labham manyate na adhikam tatah yasmin sato na dukhena guruna api vichalyate now what 20 25 years ago when i was introduced to bhakti this was a verse which inspired me very much to focus on krishna consciousness krishna says that this is the state of spiritual absorption what is its characteristic if you achieve it you will not long for anything else achieving this will free you from craving for anything more and then he says dukhena guruna api na vichalyate even if great distress comes it will not disturb you so it will free you from lamenting so now we can think of there are many things important for us but is there anything if we achieve it it will free us from craving or lamenting now i might become we might become the wealthiest person in the whole country no we might have our dream job we might have our dream house but is it going to free us from craving and lamenting no it's not so now it's not that these things are bad and we should not pursue them but pursue them in proportion not at the cost not that they consume us so much that we give up so so give up the 5 million dollar gain so krishna consciousness alone is the 5 million dollar gain because when we become conscious of krishna we will become free from craving and lamenting so by keeping things in perspective not the 5 dollar bill also matters but as compared to 5 million dollar it doesn't matter that much so we can see life's dualities with equanimity we can respond to them with equanimity with maturity if our vision is focused on the 5 million dollar gain so yes this bad thing has happened this good thing has happened but my purpose is to move toward krishna so let me focus on that that's how we can transcend duality okay what is this slogan is 5.20 520 in the bhagavad gita na praharishi priyam prapti that is 622 okay so Okay. Yes. Until what time should we go on, bro? What is the time right now? It's eight thirteen. Yeah, we can have. Okay. Yes, please. Um, uh, for going towards Krishna, um, what what are some things which, as a lay person, I can do? Like, are there any? I know it's a big question. Okay. Yes. Like, as a lay person, I'm. Yeah, I understand. I understand. I'm coming to this. Okay. As a lay person. Uh, what are the things we can do to go towards krishna broadly we talk about a b c d four things as association books chanting and deity worship so association means and this is the first and the most important thing that we need to associate with those who are devoted to krishna those who are trying to move toward krishna our desires are not just linear they are triangular linear means we see something and i want it say we see go to some uh, supermarket and see some delicious food item i want to eat it that's linear desire okay but our desires are not just linear sometimes some things don't look that attractive mm-hmm. but they are important for us so then it's only if we see somebody else doing that that we feel like doing it so does any of you know what is a baklava Okay, <laughs> still here. So baklava, what is it? Yeah, it's Arabian sweet, isn't it? Arabic sweet. So about four, five years, five, six years ago, I had gone to Australia. I had gone to one friend's house. 
and you would and you would his house and he said that yes we are having food so he said i got baklava would you like to have it i had never heard of a baklava and the name baklava doesn't sound very pleasant also <laughs> it is not a sweet name baklava <laughs> okay <laughs> so i said maybe later and there was another friend also who was with me and then he said give me and i took the baklava and he was eating it and he was relishing it as if he was in you could say culinary samadhi <laughs> <laughs> when i saw him eating and relish, oh, delicious i said okay give me one <laughs> so seeing or hearing about the baklava did not create the desire but seeing someone else hmm, enjoying it created the desire the same way for us our desire to go towards krishna our desire to grow spiritually it may not come just by knowing about by oh, i know krishna is there but we associate so coming for programs like this you now we have a center over here where we have every weekly sunday programs associating with those who are devoted to krishna that is that is vital at the first and foremost step then b is books we can't associate always so we have books which we can read periodically books also nourish our intelligence so why should we practice bhakti it is not just a ritual that we want to do because our that's our tradition or that's what people around us are doing it there is a whole philosophical reasoning how this can help us to fulfill the ultimate purpose of life so that philosophical nourishment is important and that comes by study of books c is chanting that is the holy names of krishna with the kirtan of the hari krishna mantra so god manifests in this age as his holy name and chanting is a very powerful way to connect with him <coughs> that's chanting and d is deity worship like we have the images of the lord and we worship them we pray to them we offer our food to them and then we take their remnants as prasad so that way we can may if we have deities at our home we can make our temp home also into a temple so through this abcd we all can grow practice bhakti and go closer to krishna while in our world while we are in our own professional social familial lives thank you so thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna